leading our plenary session on 5G and future RF communications, Program Executive Officer, Army Command Control Communications Tactical, Brigadier General Robert Collins. Good morning, and welcome to the 2020 DARPA Electronics Resurgence Initiative Summit. I'm here today with Brigadier General Robert Collins to discuss the process the Army is employing to modernize the tactical network through capability set fielding and the challenges in terms of network transport and 5G implementation. Sir, can you please describe your role in Army tactical network modernization and the approach the Army is taking to integrate and field new technologies as part of capability sets? You know, one of the first things I'd like to do is, is thank DARPA for the opportunity to come in. I really appreciate this opportunity and, and thank you for setting up this very vital uh, forum. As described in our national defense strategy, we've really entered a new era of, of great power competition. And this really requires an Army that can operate across all of our domains, whether it be sea, land, uh, air, uh, space, cyberspace, um, and really across a dispersed you know, global landscape. And critical to us achieving you know, su successful outcomes are gonna, us going to be able to advance uh, mission command and some of our sensor to sh shooter linkages and really accelerating um, the kill chain. And this requires a network and a modernization of that network that's focused on increased capacity, resiliency, you know, the intuitive nature, expeditionary nature, and the survivability. Um, so what, what I'd tell you, we, we have developed a powerful synergy with, with the network CFT focused in on concepts requirements and, and our PEO um, C3T focused on, on the programs. And, and the CFT really determines um, you know, d determines the priorities and what we're focused in on, and they do that by working with uh, S&T community uh, through research and development through industry and, and a lot of the experimentation. And, and the PEO really assists and focuses in on the how, and we do that with the programs, uh, through program management, through the contracts, uh, through testing, through the fielding and training. And, and I'll tell you that the Army is really no, no longer interested in developing uh, its own tactical network. Instead, we're, we're focused on developing an, an open systems architecture uh, so that we can modularly add components, uh, so that we can keep pace with the threat, uh, so that we can iterate based on the latest technologies, and most importantly, uh, we can uh, continue to iterate based on soldier feedback. And we do that through uh, what we've developed based on our analysis is a set of, of uh, capability sets and, and two-year uh, cycles. Uh, and what this is, we see this as a very enduring process. Every two years that we'll go through a design, a preliminary design, a final critical design, uh, we'll field, and at the same time we're starting to, to shape and develop our next capability set uh, as those technologies uh, continue to emerge. What are some specific development priorities of the next capability set? Well, as I uh, as I mentioned, it's an iterative uh, it's an iterative nature. So, capability set twenty one, just to kind of set uh, uh, set context, it was focused in on being expeditionary and intuitive. And our capability set twenty three is really focused in on uh, increasing our capacity, uh, increasing our resiliency, um, and, and also beginning to to uh, converge some of our software applications. Uh, Cape set twenty three is really uh, here uh, in the what we're focusing on the near term from a design perspective uh, and I'll tell you there's a number of things that we're working on with industry probably specifically a, a couple areas of interest uh, uh, data management and some of the software convergence that I already mentioned uh, as we start to adopt cloud artificial intelligence and machine learning uh, I'll also tell you network operations and how we manage and prioritize how we visualize uh, how we can simplify that make that more intuitive a lot of our RF, our radio frequency, you know, how we can conceal that, uh, you know, provide decoys and, and work things such as uh, obfuscation uh, so that we can mask uh, the enemy of, of where that we're emitting. And then really some of the things we want to take advantage of are uh, you know, there's a, a lot of work going on across uh, low Earth orbit and medium Earth orbit uh, satellite constellations. So that has a lot to offer from our network thickening and extending uh, beyond line of sight. 
A Cape Set 25 uh, obviously is the natural follow-on to that, uh, to Cape Set 23, and really, you know, as cloud um, matures, we'll be taking advantage there. We anticipate at that time, uh, LEO, a lot of the investments in the low Earth orbit uh, will be available, and then also the potential to incorporate uh, 5, 5G. How might future capability sets leverage 5G and or commercial partnerships to accomplish modernization priorities? And if I can for maybe just a minute on, on, on 5G, I, I think it does offer some significant advantages uh, for increased throughput and, and reduced latency. But I think one of the things that we need to make sure that we keep uh, uh, fundamental is the unique um, environment that the, the military and our army operates in. And so uh, there will certainly be, you know, rough terrain, uh, foliage, blockage, and, and some of the limitations there. So I, I think um, uh, in addition to that, we're going to have to increasingly operate across a, a global and a geographically dispersed environment. And so uh, we really can't afford to rely on, you know, towers and, and, and relay stations and relay points. And so we're going to have to and I think one of the things we're going to have to do is, you know, how, how can we take and best employ some of this technology? You know, how do we, um, you know, how do we link it into our current environment and ensure that it's mobile? And, and then probably importantly, too, is make sure how do we uh, secure some of the endpoints associated with the technology? And I think that's really an area that we'll, we'll be reaching out to industry, academia, and others uh, to see how we best incorporate that as we get ready. How do you see proliferated low Earth orbit constellations affecting the Army's current use of traditional GeoSatCom? Yeah, so I, I think um, with our ever increasing global operations, and, and you couple that in with um, you know an increasing demand for bandwidth, um, you know, increasingly um, you know uh, com complex applications. Um, and, and really, there's some some game-changing, um, you know, low Earth orbit and me medium Earth orbit, you know, game-changing technologies out there. I think we're really going to have to learn how do we incorporate those. You know, what I would describe as more of a, a multi-layered approach, not necessarily focused in on, you know, one p particular entity uh, or the other. I, I think the other thing that that uh, Leo and Mio are going to allow us the opportunity to to do is. You know, potentially some of our uh, more complex network functions and maybe even some of our mission support um, uh, capabilities and formations, we may be able to put those in an area in a, in a more safe sanctuary and, and allow our warfighting formations, our brigades and divisions to, to better focus on what their tactical mission is without having to concern themselves with the force protection of those areas. So I think it's going to afford that. I think one of the other things too is um, uh, Leo and Mio are, are going to allow our, our uh, ground terminals uh, to be smaller, uh, which may allow us to be more mobile uh, and expeditionary and deployable. So I think those are, are all relatively important. We're really postured to take advantage of Leo and Mio in about the, the 2025 to 2027 time frame. Uh, and what I would tell you is uh, we've got a lot of prototyping projected for, you know, in the in between now and the 2023 time frame. And I'll, let, me, let me just talk about that for just a minute. Um, one of our PM organizations, Tactical Networks, uh, actually this summer is going to start doing some uh, lab uh, testing, lab experimentation uh, with terminals that are really going to allow us to exploit you know, some of the commercial uh, capabilities. And then, and then later on, we've been working closely with the Space and Terrestrial Communications Directorate. They're, they're based out of the uh, uh, Combat Capabilities Development Center, the CCDC, which is all part of Army Futures Command. And what they're really looking at is how do we, you know, develop or how do we work with industry on a multi-constellation, uh, you know, multi-band terminal so that we can, you know, whether it be LEO, whether it be MEO, or whether it be GEO, we can t take advantage. And as I mentioned before, it's really, you know, all about developing a, you know, having a resilient network architecture that takes advantages of all the layers that can be expeditionary for global operations. Sir, is there anything else you'd like to add? I'm really thankful uh, to be back and part of the, uh, the uh, PEOC 3T team. Uh, I'm really focused on modernizing a lot of our network areas. I, I, I uh, look forward to bringing some of the experiences I had uh, for previous assignment with you know in the intelligence and the electronic warfare domain, some of our key focus areas will continue to 
be uh, as we support uh, maintaining our, our acquisition discipline, you know, integrating our, our network, um, really reaching out and doing stakeholder engagement, but certainly first and foremost is focusing on leadership people and, and uh, maintaining a, a culture uh, that uh, is focused on innovation and, and being agile. Uh, I'll tell you FY21 is going to be a, a year of uh, significant progress for network modernization as we uh, get ready to field and, and train and deploy our capability set 21 and, and we really do a lot of shaping for our uh, capability set uh, 23. Uh, I'll continue to say we have partnered closely with our network CFT partners um, and ensure that we've got a uh, tightly nested uh, a battle rhythm as we get ready to focus on our network modernization efforts and really making sure that we continue to monitor and pace with the threat uh, but we, our centerpiece is on soldier feedback uh, as we iterate that into the process and so we look forward to having a continued dialogue with industry, academia and, and really the, the entire collective team so thanks for allowing me the opportunity to be here today. And now presenting DARPA Microsystems Technology Office Program Manager, Dr. Tim Hancock. Thank you. Uh, this morning I'm pleased to speak to you about next generation uh, phased arrays. So uh, in having a conversation about next generation phased arrays, it's useful to look at where we've been with phased arrays. DARPA has invested in this uh, technology area since the beginning of DARPA. And we really started with things like passive beamforming, where we had phased arrays that are basically, they radiate into space, and then often quasi-optically we steer a beam. But we quickly moved into an age of active analog beamforming that is still the workhorse uh, for today's phased arrays. This has been assisted by investments uh, from DARPA along the way. Many of you are probably familiar with programs like the MIMIC program during the 80s and 90s, uh, as well as a shift toward more and more use of silicon technology uh, as we moved into uh, the late 90s and early 2000s. About 10 years ago, uh, there was a shift toward digital beamforming. And a great example of this is the Space Fence program. The Space Fence program, for those of you who aren't aware, is an element level digital beamforming array uh, that basically uh, looks into space to monitor debris. Uh, it has been really enabled by COTS electronics, such as FPGAs, uh, as well as high-power gallium nitride, because this is a radar. Now, beyond Space Fence, DARPA made investments in the ACT program. Now, the goal of the ACT program was to uh, try to figure out how to build arrays on a commercial time scale. And it turns out a really great way to do that was to move the uh, architecture to a largely digital architecture so that technology could scale uh, and move faster. That is the same principle that we're leveraging in the MIDAS program. But it's a bit challenger, more challenging because we're at a higher frequency. Uh, so here we intend to leverage uh, our past investments in device technology, circuit design, and packaging advancements so uh, that we could enable these new digital beamforming architectures. So why do we even care about millimeter wave systems? Well, uh, for a moderately sized antenna, uh, the millimeter wave systems uh, give us physical security through narrow beams. We use this today on tactical platforms such as the F-22 and the F-35. Now, unfortunately, with uh, narrow beams comes networking challenges. So when you're looking at the world through a soda straw, you have to be able to discover the network uh, and you have to find your neighbors. And so what you would really like to be able to do is uh, have a multi-beam, multi-beam multi, uh, mesh topology such that uh, nodes can talk to each other simultaneously. If you're able to do this, then you're able to increase the network throughput by up to 100x, and you're able to decrease the network discovery time by about 1,000x. So we really think that this is enabled by multi-beam digital arrays. Um, and so with those multi-beamed arrays, we want to enable multi-beam network communications. This uh, will create multiple simultaneous beams in all directions for simplified network discovery, but at the same time provide wide bandwidth and frequency agility instead of point solutions that we've typically had with uh, analog beamforming solutions. 
So the, the MIDAS program is developing this digital array at millimeter wave. And this presents two key challenges. One of those is how do we develop the, the digital RF silicon tile uh, in the 18 to 50 gigahertz band? Uh, this needs to include all of your RF transceivers, your uh, data converters, uh, and the first level of digital signal processing to manage that data. Secondarily, uh, the other key challenge is uh, the development of wideband antennas and the TR components necessary, such as the power amplifiers and low noise amplifiers, as well as the, the need for heterogeneous integration and packaging to combine these two uh, technology thrusts together. When we're successful, we think that this will provide a scalable solution uh, for multiple applications and enable things like the line of sight tactical communications I've told you about, as well as traditional and emerging proliferated LEO SATCOM. And with this, we think this will help us, uh, the DOD, dominate the millimeter wave uh, spectrum with wideband digital beamforming. And I suspect within the next decade, we'll see the commercial world start to adopt more digital beamforming at millimeter wave uh, as well to support uh, massive MIMO uh, solutions as that demand grows. So with that, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Larry Kushner uh, from Raytheon Technologies. He's a principal engineering fellow and he leads the digital RF tile uh, development for the Raytheon effort under the MIDAS program. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'll be discussing next generation phased array technology that we are developing under the MIDAS program. Raytheon is really excited about being part of this program developing element level digital beam forming. And, and we're excited because of the new capabilities that it brings. Uh, the, the, most important of which is simultaneous multiple beams over a wide field of regard. And so simultaneous, I mean many beams pointing in many different directions all at the same time. And this is in contrast to traditional systems that are based on mechanically steered apertures or even analog phased arrays that it can only point in one direction at a given time. So the ability to point everywhere all at once um, means that you can have fast searches, fast acquisitions, and you can consider doing high comm on the move where you have moving platforms and even though you have a, a narrow beam, the beams are able to quickly uh, steer and, uh, and, and, and track uh, due to the element level digital beam forming. Um, the fact that we're doing this at millimeter wave frequencies and the fact also because we have narrow beams that come with millimeter wave frequencies, um, we can uh, talk about gigabit per second or even terabit per second data rates on these mobile platforms. By keeping the RF path uh, simple and, and we have a software defined multiband multifunction aperture. And you'll, you'll see that when, when we discuss our architecture for the RF, um, it, it uses direct down conversion, which makes it very generic and, and waveform agnostic. So there are lots of applications in, in the military uh, for this technology. Comms that we've already discussed, radar, EW, SIGINT, situational awareness. So you might be wondering, you know, if, if element level di digital beamforming is so great, why hasn't it been done before? Well. There are a lot of reasons. Um, up until now, it probably wasn't possible. Um, there are concerns uh, over DC power consumption. If you're going to put a data converter at every element, um, concerns about how do you do it over a broad band at millimeter wave frequencies, um, concerns over packing it all in. And again, since we're talking millimeter waves, the array pitch is going to be very small. And for Midas, it's a three millimeter pitch. So you have to get all the electronics on that pitch and it can't take too much power or you're not going to be able to get the heat out. So there have been a lot of concerns. Oh, one more concern is uh, um, the fact that you're doing digital beam forming. You don't have any spatial filtering prior to the data conversion. So you need to keep the whole system linear so that um, interference doesn't saturate your receiver. Um, but as you'll see it uh, during the rest of this talk, the MIDAS program has um, created technology that, that overcomes all these obstacles and now makes this capability possible. So what are the enabling technologies? Starting with the antenna, we have a very low profile design. Again, one of the uh, uh, concepts here is to make something that you could put on the skin of an aircraft and um, 
but as a result it needs to be very thin. Underneath the antenna uh, we have the electronics and, and right now there's no one technology that's best suited for all, all of the electronics. So we, we've instead used a heterogeneous approach where we're using fine pitch 3D heterogeneous integration uh, to connect um, the various uh, layers of our electronics and we'll go into more details uh, in a second. Right underneath the antenna we have our uh, RF front end and that's uh, in indium phosphide that both the transmit and receiver ICs along with the uh, TR switch. We're going to be covering 18 to 50 gigahertz which is nearly a 3 to 1 bandwidth. As I mentioned before, we're going to connect all of these uh, devices with a fine pitch interconnect. We are using 100 micron pitch and, and for that we have bumps on our die that are 60 microns in diameter. And, and the photo at the bottom right shows that we've successfully demonstrated attachment of these die uh, to the interposer um, as part of our phase one efforts. Uh, pushing down in the stack underneath the uh, 3.5 front end, we have a CMOS ASIC. This is a 45 nanometer CMOS ASIC. It's about 10 by 10 millimeters. We have 32 channels of 18 to 50 gigahertz transceiver on this ASIC. That includes everything from the RF uh, down to baseband, the data converters, and the DSP in order to do the first layer of digital beam forming. So you can see that. Um, through a combination of these technologies that MIDAS is developing, uh, we will we'll now be able to do millimeter wave element level digital beam forming, giving us those great capabilities we talked about on the first slide. Okay, so now I'm going to walk through the different pieces of our design. Starting with the antenna, we have a 16 element dual polarized wideband tile as a building block. Dual polar uh, this means horizontal and vertical polarization, and from those you can also create circular polarization if you'd like. We have a low loss differential design. It's low loss because we've eliminated balance, balance or balance to unbalance converters that, that often appear between the antenna and the electronics, but by eliminating those we reduce the loss, improve our noise figure, improve our output power, and also you get better um, rejection of any common mode interference. So this approach is scalable. We can take this tile and tile a number of these to create arbitrarily large arrays. Uh, shown here is a 256 element array. And when you do that, um, you can create some very nice antenna patterns from, from a reasonable number of elements. Shown below is a 1024 element aperture at 30 gigahertz. And you can see um, that we can scan almost down to the horizon, plus or minus 70 degrees. The pattern does get a little bit wider um, as you get towards the horizon, but overall very uh, respectable patterns across the uh, full scan angle. And then versus frequency, the plot on the right shows you that um, as you go to higher frequencies, the antenna gain increases, and it increases by focusing more of the energy directly on, on the bore site. And so it's a little hard to see, but the, uh, the green beam there at 50 gig is narrower, say, than the 30 gig or the 18 gigahertz beams. Okay, so moving to the electronics, we've chosen a direct conversion architecture. Uh, for those of you not familiar with uh, this, um, what it means is we're taking um, a signal at RF and we're directly down converting it to baseband, as, sh as shown on that upper right hand figure. Uh, it's very simple. Um, basically we come into the receiver um, and we have the LNA which is an indium phosphide shown on the left but then passed to the right of the dotted line is our CMOS transceiver and that basically starts with a uh, coupler and then a mixer and, and then the first amplification is at baseband. So it's a very simple design as I mentioned earlier it's very generic and, and it's very reconfigurable. Um, because we've minimized the amount of circuitry at, at millimeter wave frequency, it's low DC power, has small die area, and that's important, as we said, for an application like Midas, where we're trying to jam it all into a th three millimeter pitch. We have a reconfigurable center frequency, by just change the local oscillator frequency, and that changes um, the frequency at which we tune this to. 
the frequency selectivity comes at baseband, but effectively that filter shape uh, is effectively transformed up to RF, and so you can get very narrow filters, much narrower than you could if you try to do the filtering directly at millimeter waves. And one side benefit that's a little bit subtle is that the data converters sample at half the sample frequency that they would if you had a uh, direct RF or IF sampled approach, although the penalty you pay is you have twice as many data converters. Um, but, but they are easier to make since they are, do sample at half the rate. So um, there are some challenges, um, but, but these are actually well known for direct conversion, DC offsets and image suppression. Uh, DC offset comes about that since we're taking our signal of interest at the RF frequency and down converting to zero hertz, any DC offsets in the system um, what could uh, interfere with your signal, but we have uh, built in adjustments to it, minimize the DC offsets in the uh, RF and baseband paths, and also any residual offset getting through the A to D converter can be calibrated out uh, digitally. You also need to remove the image since we're folding uh, the, those two pieces of spectrum shown in red and green uh, basically on top of each other. Um, you need a way to sort that out, but by maintaining quadrature components, in phase and quadrature, IQ, um, you can, through DSP, sort that out and you can improve the image suppression by adjusting the amplitude and phase relationships to make it a perfect quadrature. So I guess I've already talked through these mitigation strategies. We can do digital uh, calibration of offset and image. And then the other thing I didn't mention already is that our um, we have a low gain signal path, and, and by keeping it low gain, um, any offsets uh, will be small enough so they don't take away much dynamic range from the A to D converter. And keeping everything differential minimizes coupling of the local oscillator back to the RF that also uh, creates DC offsets. So, so in summary, direct conversion is an excellent choice for MIDAS that, where you need the low power, the small die area, and simple design, and also something that's reconfigurable and generic. Okay, so uh, now let's turn our attention to the RF front end. As mentioned already, we do not have a balance. The whole system is differential. Um, we need to, we, we chose to use indium phosphide for the front end because indium phosphide has very high performance and, and also uh, it's well suited to making compact broadband designs at millimeter wave frequency due to the high FT, F max of the technology and the high power density achieved. And you can see um, we actually need a pair of LNAs and a pair of, of, of power amplifiers um, per element since we have uh, two uh, polarizations, H and V. And so uh, you can see the small die size here, uh, 1.5 by 0.6 and 1.1 by 0.64 for the, uh, the two indium phosphide dye that are needed on every transceiver channel. <clears throat> and shown on the upper right here is our power amplifier performance. And, and again, this, this is, is quite impressive. We put out over 20 dBm, which is 100 milliwatts, across the 18 to 50 gigahertz band with almost 40% power added efficiency. So a very efficient way to create power um, by doing it in indium phosphide. We also uh, benefit from indium phosphide on the receive side with a 2.5 dB noise figure LNA. Again, uh, that's across the 18 to 50 gigahertz band. And so by, by having the high performance compound semiconductor devices at the, as the front end, it, what it does is it relaxes the requirements on the CMOS transceiver that follows and makes it much more achievable than it would be otherwise. So uh, let's turn our attention now to that CMOS transceiver that follows the indium phosphide front end. Again, it's a complete RF to, to bits system on chip. We come in at 18 to 50 gigahertz on receive or we transmit at 18 to 50 gigahertz on transmit. Um, but then we have the entire system, the trans transmitter, the receivers, the data converters, all on this chip. We have, this supports 16 elements, two polarizations, so that's 32 channels. We have the high selectivity filtering, uh, again, low gain, high dynamic range receiver. And since it's uh, direct conversion, we need IQ pairs. Um, and so we actually have 64 low power ADCs and DACs on this single die. And again, the die is about 10 by 10 millimeters. Uh, 
Beyond the uh, RF and analog, we also have all the signal processing to do the first level of, of element level digital beam forming right on the chip. Uh, we can support two beams at 200 megahertz bandwidth, or we can support more beams at reduced bandwidth, maintaining a constant beam bandwidth product. And in phase two of the MIDAS program, we are actually going to increase the beam bandwidth product by 10x relative to these numbers. One um, interesting aspect that, that's really important is, is local oscillator distribution. How do you get an 18 to 50 gigahertz signal uh, to all of these different um, transceivers? Well, we're able to do it right on the chip using um, RF distribution techniques in, until it gets uh, all the way to the, uh, the mixers in all of the transceivers. And then we also have uh, RF calibration inputs that are used to um, calibrate the receiver and then the receiver is used in a loopback mode to calibrate the transmitter. Finally, we do all of this for less than 151 milliwatts per channel. It's everything from the millimeter wave through baseband, that data conversion, and the DSP uh, 100, for 150 milliwatts. And this chip is currently in test right now, and I'll show you on the next few slides some preliminary measurements. Starting with the receiver, again, we, since we have that indium phosphide LNA, uh, we're able to make the CMOS receiver itself um, Relatively modest performance. It has about a 10 dB noise figure, but it doesn't matter because the LNA sets the noise figure. The indium phosphide LNA up front sets the noise figure. And so we can start the receiver with a mixer first approach, which is very linear um, and produces minimum distortion. And then we can have just a modest amount of gain in front of the eight analog to digital converter, uh, which is a 10 bit design. And you know, we were consciously did not want to over design the ADC. Um, because in a phased array application, the noise from all the ADCs adds incoherently while the signal adds coherently. So in an array of a thousand elements, you actually get a 30 dB SNR improvement. So you don't want to over-design the ADC because every bit you add of ENOB to an ADC uh, take, costs four times the DC power. So we actually, although it's a 10-bit ADC, uh, the ENOB is more on the order of uh, 8 bits ENOB. And to show you the measured performance, you can see this is our tire receive chain. Um, we have demonstrated 60 dB of uh, two-tone third-order inter intermodulation distortion. And that's important, again, because there's no spatial filtering prior to the data conversion in a, a, a um, digital beamform system. And so uh, you need to be able to handle that interference without corrupting the signals of interest all the way uh, through the A to D. Turning our attention to the transmit side, we again use a direct conversion approach, and it's a mirror image of the um, receive side, except that we do have a millimeter wave amplifier in this case to have sufficient output power to drive the indium phosphide power amplifier. Uh, we start the chain with the DAC, and you can see this is measured performance from our DAC. Again, it's a 10-bit DAC demonstrating uh, 65 dB of SFDR here around 30 megahertz output. And if you sweep the DAC, you can see that we maintain better than 60 dB SFDR across the entire uh, baseband frequency range of 0 to 100 megahertz. So this is an 800 mega sample per second digital to analog converter, and it achieves that, that excellent 60 dB SFDR for less than, uh, for just 2.6 milliwatts of DC power, which is really quite impressive. So speaking of DC power, again, it's very important where you're packing all this electronics in um, on a 3 millimeter pitch. Uh, so this is a breakdown of the received DC power. You can see, uh, worst case is 151 milliwatts with 16 beams. The DSP power drops when you go to one beam um, to 130. So the whole receiver is only 138 milliwatts with one beam. And then you can see the breakdown. Uh, roughly a third of it goes to the analog to digital converters, which each consume 23 milliwatts. The millimeter rate receiver is about 39 milliwatts. And then the, the DSP is variable, again, based on the uh, number of beams you're supporting. The 18 to 50 gigahertz local oscillator distribution only consumes 17 milliwatts. Partly that's due to it being amateurized across excuse me, um, all 32 channels. And then there's a CERTES, again, that's amateurized across all the channels as well to get the data on and off the chip. In uh, transmit mode, the story is very similar. Um, in this case, those D to A's I just showed you were very low power, uh, consuming just uh, 5 milliwatts total for the pair. 
Uh, the transmitter has that millimeter wave amplifier, so its power is a little bit higher than the receiver. And DSP is comparable to receive a little bit lower, and the 30s and LO are the same. So again, no matter what mode we're in, transmit, receive, no matter how many beams, uh, we stay below that 151 milliwatts. So now let's talk about tiling a bunch of, of these building blocks and, and then what type of um, performance we can get. <clears throat> so this, this shows you with just 16 tiles, 256 elements, so that's 4.8 by 4.8 centimeters or roughly 2 by 2 inches you can get 200 beams at 50 gigahertz, which is, and you can see the top view and the, the uh, side view of the antenna patterns. Um, so what about at, at other frequencies, lower frequencies, um, and what happens when you have uh, more elements? So that's what uh, these plots show you. The upper plot is showing versus frequencies. So, so as the frequency uh, drops, the beams get fatter, and so you can't pack as many beams in close proximity, they end up overlapping, and so that's why the number of beams goes down at lower frequencies. Um, but, uh, so th what you can do then is you can add more elements, and so if you grow the array, say, to a thousand elements, then you can get back up over 200 beams, even down at 18 gigahertz. And as you add more elements, as you can see in the bottom plot, uh, the antenna gain goes up. Um, giving you a much more narrowly focused beam, which is good for high data rate uh, communications. <clears throat> so, you know, with something like a thousand elements, we can create some really interesting um, uh, capability that, that's tactically relevant for uh, a lot of DoD applications. So, in summary, uh, MIDAS is creating uh, the key technology needed to, for millimeter wave element level digital beam forming, which allows us to have simultaneous agile beams, which is needed for COM on the move or, or other applications. And it's enabled by 3D heterogeneous integration of the aperture, the RF front end, and a mixed signal CMOS ASIC. Now, the tile building block that we've created scales to large arrays with hundreds of high gain millimeter wave beams. So um, this technology, again, as I started this talk, we're very excited about because it's going to enable the next generation agile multifunction, multiband military systems. So with that, I'd just like to thank um, Tim Hancock for having the vision uh, for the MIDAS program and the whole DARPA MTO and the rest of the government team for their continued support uh, through this program. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. Next up. DARPA Strategic Technology Office Program Manager, Dr. Tom Rondeau. We're here to talk about specialized compute. And we've talked a little bit now about how uh, networking functions require these kinds of uh, compute pr and programmable processes. I'm going to uh, take another look at that same problem, but come at it from a different angle, which is 5G. And why does 5G, why would we care about processors in a wireless networking world? Well, this graph is showing us, over time, the explosion of opportunities and applications within the 5G or future wireless networking space, but also the challenges of how much more power and performance we're, we're looking to get out of, uh, out of the processing subsystems that make these, these systems up. So you look at wearables, IoT, vehicular technologies, uh, even things like massive MIMO and millimeter wave, all of them are, are requiring more out of our processing systems, uh, and many of them are power limited. They're battery powered devices that we're hoping to last for, for hours to days to weeks to years if possible. Uh, so we want to have specialization to help focus our, our efficiencies to get those power performance metrics down. But if we're also increasing the number of applications, we need programmability on top of these. We can't be specializing for every application and still uh, imagine the, this explosion of, of potential market uh, spaces of this future 5G world. And that's what we're talking about in, the, uh, in this talk is a program that we have focused on programmability and efficiency. And that's called the domain-specific system on chip. So this is looking at solving that wireless uh, networking problem of, uh, of getting high performance, high e highly efficient computational architectures that can also be programmed to change and adapt with needs of the market, needs of the warfighter. 
the way we're doing this is looking at these many core heterogeneous processing architectures. And what that means is we have uh, dozens to possibly in the future hundreds of processor elements that are specialized to different parts of the application space. We can build a hardware accelerator that focuses on just one math problem and does it really well. But that hasn't scaled well in the past in making a programmable surface that we can write applications to. That's what's hard about this program and what DARP is focused on uh, here. One is how do we identify what to accelerate? Once we do, how do we, how do we uh, schedule the applications to take advantage of those hardware accelerators? And three, how do we build the programming models and programming interfaces to, uh, to alleviate the burden of the, the developer from having to understand the bare metal? So I like to say I want the application uh, designers to focus on the application, not the chip. We think we've come a long way in the last two years of this program uh, to solve these problems. First, uh, we've built new tools to automatically map code to the accelerator. So understanding the affinity of the algorithm itself to the underlying processor architecture that might, might be best uh, utilized to solve that. Second, we've created scheduling algorithms that operate in the nanosecond time frame that are beating or at least at par with the best human optimization or optimizers. Uh, these are experts. They're often called ninjas because they're hard to find and expensive. Uh, we can't afford the time and the, um, the market space for uh, hiring a ninja to solve all of these problems. These tools are going to alleviate that burden from us and accelerate our ability to, uh, to create uh, new apps and, and, and new ideas. This leads to what we estimate to be about a 40 to 100x programmer productivity benefit. So this means the time that it goes from idea to solution can be up to 100 times faster than today's uh, processing and programming environments. Now to help us solve this, we also are innovating on the hardware itself. So we're building uh, or innovating on top of network on chip architectures. So we're advancing the state of the art in high bandwidth and low latency uh, interconnects. We're also solving problems of if we've identified a new algorithm that needs to be accelerated, how do we uh, integrate that accelerator into the, the chip, either through programmable fabric of that chip or in the next iteration of that chip as a hard-coded uh, accelerator? Uh, we've addressed all of these in the program uh, and are pretty excited to, uh, to see where we are today. And how we're doing this and the overall vision of, the, of this program uh, is summarized in these two loops. This outer loop represents the hardware, uh, and the inner loop represents the software loop, and they work together. Uh, so there's, there's actually outsprings from, from these uh, as we go through. So what we're trying to do is observe the application, or I should say the domain space, and a domain is made up of many applications. What do those applications require from the, their acceleration? Use that to figure out how to build a chip. Use that to decide what that processor architecture and compiler tool suite needs to look like, and then actually build the chip get it out there, put applications on there, uh, execute them, and learn from what we've done so that we can iterate and, and optimize over time. And while that's happening, the internal loop, we program, compile, uh, push it down onto the hardware and schedule those applications and measure the performance. And again, it's another iterative loop and optimizing over time, so we're creating uh, more and more optimized solutions uh, as we iterate. Uh, we've come a long way. And to, to highlight some of the uh, uh, key aspects of this program will be Dan Bliss from Arizona State University, who's the principal investigator on one of the, the projects uh, of DSOC that's specifically focused on highly performant, energy efficient uh, system on chip uh, architectures for wireless communications. So I'm going to be talking to you about our project, the main focus, Advanced Software Reconfigurable Heterogeneous System on Chip, or Dash SOC. So if you think about system engineering, uh, we have a number of requirements. We need to do some sort of communication, some sensing problems, something like that. Um, and as an example, let's consider the rental car return problem. So we probably have all done this. You drive up into uh, the rental car return. Uh, there are people there who are ready to help you. Uh, they have some tablet, and that tablet is going to be wirelessly connected to some system. And there's only a few thousand bits that you actually need to enter, um, some car ID, some record, uh, maybe mileage or something like that. So it's, it's only a few thousand bits of information needs to get across. 
Uh, also, if you think about it, it's a pretty rich scattering environment. Uh, it's a big echo chamber electromagnetically inside these uh, garages. And, and so the way that this is typically solved, uh, you look around and you'll notice there's a Wi-Fi router uh, mounted usually to the ceiling. And then if you look a little bit more, you'll notice there's another Wi-Fi router mounted to the ceiling not too far away. And if you look around a little bit more, you'll notice there are Wi-Fi routers all over the place. And and the, the problem is, is that it's not really a good match, the protocol and the waveform, are, they're not really a good match to the problem. And so what we need is a better waveform and, and protocol uh, to deal with this very dispersive channel um, and also only needing a few thousand bits of information to be exchanged. All right, but we're stuck with the custom uh, SOCs that we have available. And, and as a result, as system engineers, we make suboptimal system choices, and we do this based on reasonable choices that we only have certain tools available, and so those are the ones we use. And, and I suggest that we get stuck because of this. That is, there's some rigid set of computational capabilities, those those uh, limit our engineering options. And then because we pick those engineering uh, options, it reinforces those set of limited requirements and we get stuck in this sort of loop. On the Dash program, what we want to do is uh, you know, break this cycle. So uh, the Dash program, our main goal is to try to figure out how to make uh, these computations available to the system engineer and to make them relatively easy to use. So, uh, you know, it's, it's always easy to want things, but what do we want? We would like to be able to get energy efficiency that approaches that of a full custom chip. And simultaneously, we'd like to make this relatively accessible. We would like to be able to do this with uh, the sort of effort that's similar to programming a, a, a scalar processor like the one that's in your, in your computer, your laptop. All right, so we do think we know how to get to this point, and that is to build heterogeneous, coarse scale heterogeneous um, socks. Uh, and we're gonna build a whole framework to develop the SOC and then uh, to use the SOC. And it's really key that we assure non-expert -exp programmability. I'll talk about that uh, more as we go along. And if we do this, I really do think that this enables the next generation of flexible RF employment. And uh, all sorts of systems will be affected by the ability to quickly develop flexible new approaches. And maybe we'll get our, our flying car as a result. So let's start by thinking about a few different approaches for implementing our manipulation of the RF spectrum. So the, the standard, of course, is to have some sort of full custom chip. We have this in the, the chip in the Wi-Fi router. We have this in our phones, uh, all over the place, Bluetooth. Uh, and if you think about it, we can implement a fairly complicated standard uh, like LTE or, or 5G with hundreds of milliwatts. And that's, that's a remarkable thing. The problem is that it takes a lot of effort to do this you know, hundred, hundreds of staff years to actually develop the full chip and get everything ready. If you want to then modify this after you, you've sent the chip out, of course, this is not possible. And if you wanted to actually run simultaneous, complicated, uh, uh, multi-threaded uh, applications, well, it's, it's going to take a lot of people. And effectively, what you'll end up doing is developing multiple chips or multiple different processors that sit there. Well, so then we can go the to the other end of the spectrum, and that is a, a, a processor which is very similar to the one you have in your, your laptop, a scalar processor. And the problem here is that even though it's easy to program, which is great, uh, the power consumption is, is very high. And it's not even clear that we can meet the throughput requirements for many systems. All right, so the next step is to implement something on the field programmable gate arrays. Uh, many DoD radios do this. Uh, it's a perfectly reasonable solution, uh, but it does still consume a fair amount of power. And for any of us who have developed systems that employ FPGAs, we know that while it's easier than developing a full custom chip, it's still a lot of work and FPGAs are typically pretty finicky systems. And if you wanna do a post deployment update, you can do that and as it is software reprogrammable, uh, but it, 
it's it's a serious uh, problem. That is, it takes a reasonable amount of effort to do this. If you want to do multiple applications simultaneously, um, you know, going through and uh, starting and stopping, well, you're probably going to give up because it's just too much work to put on an FPGA. Uh, it, it's just very complicated. All right, so this drives us to the solution of what I'll refer to as the standard heterogeneous processor. So if you know the kinds of problems that are being addressed in the, the sort of like LTE, then you can build accelerators which address those problems. And it, sure, it may not be as efficient as a full custom chip, but it can approach it. If you then say, I'm going to try to introduce some sort of non-traditional waveform, uh, something you hadn't really thought about before, but I still wanted to run on that processor. Well, what happens is on what I refer to as the standard heterogeneous processor is you get stuck. You have to run a lot of those operations on the scalar processors, which are not particularly efficient and it may not do very well. Uh, in terms of uh, introducing a new waveform, uh, well, it's once again easier than designing a full custom chip it still is very difficult. It turns out trying to figure out how to implement those applications on a standard heterogeneous processor uh, is very complicated because you have to figure out how to thread the data through the system. Um, and what you typically find is that there's a person on the team that knows how to do it and no one else does. Um, if you want to do a post deployment update, it turns out you have to sort of redo all the threading. Uh, all, everything has to be almost done from scratch, uh, but you can do it. Um, but it's a lot of effort. If you're going to try to do multiple simultaneous applications that are dynamic, starting and stopping, I think you're that person who knew how to do all that programming is just going to quit. And that drives us to Dash. So we have the same benefits of the standard heterogeneous processor, but uh, we actually have some extra tools as well. So one is that we have what we call the DAP. Uh, it's, it's basically a systolic array processor, and it allows us to produce personalities uh, of accelerators. So we're not completely tied to the accelerators that we ship the chip with. We can actually impose new uh, new accelerators on the on the chip because we're doing lots of support in terms of the software. Uh, to implement a new waveform is not that onerous. We should be able to do it with not a lot more effort than actually the standard scalar processor. In terms of a post-deployment update, well, it should be relatively easy. And in terms of running multiple simultaneous applications, uh, we're designing the chip to do that. And because we're including a lot of intelligence on the chip for resource management and for the software development support, this is doable. And our goal is to run five complicated applications in under five watts. and as far as uh, it looks at the moment, we really will be able to do that. So let's talk a little bit more about heterogeneous processors. So we're going to enable this computational efficiency by making an observation. So we'd like to get from the performance of a scalar processor up to a full custom ASIC. And so what you see here is you have uh, basically gigaops per watt along the vertical axis and node technology along the horizontal axis. And what you can see, there's more than a couple orders of magnitude difference between these. Uh, node technology ends up being um, basically a surrogate for time. So everything gets better, but that distance sort of remains the same. If you think about a typical RF application, there are multiple tasks involved. And if you take a look at the computational requirements of those tasks, Typically, there are a handful of them, just a few, which completely dominate the computations. And then usually there are a number of higher layer tasks, which can be very complicated, but aren't computationally expensive. So if we identify those tasks which are computationally expensive, then we can build accelerators that go after those particular tasks. And uh, for here, I have an example of a multi-antenna receiver, which maybe it does some interference mitigation. Uh, and, and what we see here is uh, matrix multiplies ends up being a big part of the cost. There's a lot of channel estimations being done dynamically, a lot of covariance estimates being done. And then FFTs, of course, are expensive. Uh, 
uh, need to do matrix inverses, so we implement that using a QR decomposition. And then in any comm system, the error correcting codes for the forward error correction is relatively expensive as well. And so if we can do these sorts of things well and efficiently, then the overall performance is pretty good. And that leads us to the development of the types of accelerators that we're going to have on our chip, on the, on the dash sock. All right, so let's think about programming of these, these chips, these heterogeneous processors. So we have some code. We'd like to take that code and we like to run it on this core scale heterogeneous processor. But there is a problem. So what you see here in the graph on the right, we have a number of different applications. Uh, we have Wi-Fi transmit receive. We have some radar processing. Uh, we have single carrier communication system transmit receive. And we have some temporal mitigation, which is useful for RF convergence. And you see a few different accelerators uh, indicated on along the vertical axis. Uh, there's decoder, matrix multiply, FFT, and a couple of different types of, of uh, processors, scalar processors. And just by eye, as you see, we, as we switch from application to application, the structure of what needs to be done and how uh, the data needs to be moved around the chip is completely different. And historically, you would have to have somebody basically do that by hand. Now, if you then have a dynamic situation where I have multiple applications running, starting, and stopping independently, that's just overwhelming. So what we really want to do is we want to make sure that we have, even though we've built this wonderful, uh, this wonderful heterogeneous processor, we don't make it a single application processor. And those of us who have seen heterogeneous processors built previously know that that's not uncommon. All right, so we need to make it easier. In particular, we need to reduce the reliance on expert development. That is the person who's an expert on implementing things on the heterogeneous processor. We want people to be experts on the application, not on the implementation. To do this, we need to simplify the, the compiling, the debugging, and the, the resource management, the scheduling. So to do that, we have a framework. We've built a framework to go after this. We start with a large repository of code. So we have a large number of uh, RF signal processing applications. We take that code. We perform an ontological analysis on that code or that, that repository of code. We determine typical computational relationships. Um, we can do that. I mean, you know, what, what, uh, what tasks need to talk to what tasks. And by using that information, we can then figure out what the hardware requirements are for the chip. That includes the, the network on the chip and the hardware design, what sort of accelerators we need, what sort of capabilities we need to have. Simultaneously, we have a, a software development program. And so we take those, those tasks that we have identified and we compile them. And each one of those tasks are actually built into a what we refer to as a fat binary. So let's think about the FFT for an example or as an example, we can execute the FFT on our FFT accelerator, which we have. We can execute that on the scalar processor, which we have. We can execute that on the DAP processor, which I'll explain in a minute. Uh, so we have lots of different ways to do this. And so we include all of those options in our binary. So uh, also at the same time, when you develop these core scale heterogeneous processors, you have to figure out how to debug what you're doing. What is a common problem is, you know, the, the debugging isn't necessarily that great, uh, particularly if you design the heterogeneous processor to be very focused on one application. Uh, you try to do something new, you send data into the accelerator and it comes back out and it doesn't make any sense. And every designer, you might have several different designers working on different accelerators. And as a consequence, trying to figure out what's going on, each accelerator is different. So we've developed a standard which basically makes it so that it's easy to access all the accelerators. We provide debugging information, and there's a common interface for all the accelerators. And then finally, uh, the resource management on the chip, we need to figure out how to ex execute things and how to use those fat binaries to, to, to perform the applications, to execute the applications that we have. And for that, we take our, our large set of applic uh, applications all that code, the repository of code, and we we train our intelligence scheduler, and then we use that intelligence scheduler, st intelligence scheduler, to uh, to make the decisions about when and how to pull these threads through the the processor. Uh, 
So no, you no longer need a, a domain expert, uh, you no longer need a, a chip expert to do the programming. This is done automatically by the processor itself. And as a result, we get uh, an efficient real-time implementation. Well, so we have uh, you know, FFTs and fur filters, but we're also developing some really innovative accelerators that once again, make this all viable. An important one is the ad domain adaptive processor, the DAP. It is effectively a very capable systolic array processor. This is very good for doing linear algebra type operations, and we have lots of those in signal processing. So if you need to do a QR, a QR back substitution, it maps well to the DAP. You need to do matrix multiply, it maps well to the DAP. These sorts of app, uh, tasks map well to this the DAP processor. And importantly, uh, you know, you, you get the chip out into the field and you realize there's a new uh, there's a new calculation you need to do and you, you didn't actually figure out, you didn't, didn't ship it with that. Well, you can impose new personalities on the DAP processor. So after the fact, it becomes very good at doing new linear algebra applications. All right. And then another accelerator we, we developed is a unified forward error correction accelerator. So this allows us to very, efficient, very efficiently implement turbo codes, low density paradigm codes, polar codes. Um, it's flexible. So once again, typically what you would do is you'd build a full custom uh, accelerator for each code that's tuned to the details of that code. But we are able to do this very efficiently over a wide range of codes. Um, and I, I think in, in, many, uh, in many situations, uh, a program would just focus on one of these accelerators, uh, and that would be a, a viable program on its own, and, and we're getting multiple advanced accelerators just coming along with this program. All right, so a survey of our current successes. In terms of our ontological analysis, uh, we have gotten very good at dynamic software tracing. And so for those of you who think about these problems, it's very common to do static software tracing. One of the issues with that is you might miss what's important and what's not important in doing the static code analysis. Uh, and one of the key things that allows us to do this is we have sped up the dynamic software tracing tools by over a factor of 50. And for the right kinds of applications, our accuracy is, um, is very good. In terms of our software, we have automated our ability to basically produce those fat binaries based on what we know what's going on in the code. We've done an FPGA demo of this. Uh, we standardized the, the kernel interface and debugging. We've done FPGA, FPGA demos of this. The intelligent scheduler, uh, we've enabled uh, real-time SOC resource management. So that's uh, scheduling, but it actually also includes thermal management as well. It's all integrated. Uh, We've done the, the 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 imitation. We've done an imitation learning approach, which allows us to actually use different oracles, uh, oracles, and then match the oracle using this computationally quick and efficient approach. And we've done an FPGA demo of that as well. Uh, in terms of our on-chip network, uh, we have a requirement of being able to move stuff around in under five nanoseconds. Uh, we have a path towards doing that, and we have RTL for that. In terms of hardware, uh, I've already mentioned the accelerators that we we're developing. And in terms of the DAP and the FEC, we actually have uh, RTL and FPGA uh, examples. And finally, uh, you know, if you develop a chip and it just sits there, then it doesn't mean anything, right? It has to it has to be an applic there has to be an application. And so we have a part of the team that's actually developing SDR software defined radio board, uh, and we're going to use our uh, preliminary SOCs on, on those boards and actually show over the air communications with them. And we've developed the preliminary SOC interfaces and we've actually developed the preliminary board design as well for the software defined radio. All right, path forward. So this fall, we're actually sending out a test chip, which includes the DAP. At the beginning of next year, we'll have the first spin of the processor. Beginning of the following year, we'll have the second spin of the processor. Um, not long after that, we'll have a radio de designed by General Dynamics, a multiple input, multiple output radio system, uh, which is going to demonstrate the processor. Additionally, uh, by the uh, Defense Applications Program, we have Collins Aerospace that has a number of applications that they will also demonstrate on the chip. 
And in the long run, uh, we are looking at uh, uh, other applications, lots of other applications. And one that's interesting that we've talked to multiple entities about is potentially using these chips uh, for, for space applications uh, and testing them in space. There's clearly a, a strong desire to have sophisticated processing that's very efficient and flexible. So you can update things after the fact. It's uh, hard to go install a new chip after launch. So I've been very fortunate to be able to work with an amazing team. I have my colleagues at Arizona State University, colleagues at ARM, Carnegie Mellon, General Dynamics, University of Arizona, University of Michigan, University of Texas, Austin, and as I already mentioned, Collins Aerospace. So we are enabling, I think, the next generation of software-defined RF systems. And we were very focused on the application needs for the systems. We have all the tools, we're building the chip, and we're focused on building demonstrations of the capabilities. I think the, once again, the, the future for this program in terms of what we're going to be able to achieve and the broader implications of the success are really exciting. Out of all the many, many DARPA programs that I've worked on over the years, and they've all been great, uh, this may have the broadest application to system engineers and system designers uh, across many DOD and commercial needs. Thank you for your time. Hello, I am Michael Zatman, and I am the Principal Director for Fully Network Command Control and Communications in the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering. It is our job in research and engineering to ensure the technological superiority of the US Armed Forces. We do this in order to deter any adversaries from going to war with us. We achieve this through our modernization priorities, which are listed here. For each modernization priority, there is a principal director like myself, who is responsible for the department-wide strategy in our technology area and to be the independent expert in that area across the department. And fully network command control and communications we have a simplified three-layer model. The physical layer at the bottom contains the antennas, the radios, and the waveforms. The networking layer links all of those physical layer radios together in order to get data from A to B. The application layer generates data. In our case, this is a command and control data that enables us to perform our operations. In the application layer, we have challenges with interoperability and security. In the networking layer, we have the additional challenge of how do we manage all of those physical layer resources. In the physical layer, we have the additional challenge of spectrum availability. Spectrum is limited. There is congestion and interference that we have to deal with. We would also like multifunction systems that can perform communications, sensing and navigation either simultaneously or quickly switch between them. Our last challenge is how do we implement the hardware for all of this in something with low size, weight and power? And how do we deal with our slow Department of Defense upgrade cycle? It turns out that the physical layer challenges and the upgrade cycle can be dealt with through advanced digital signal processing. In the commercial world, advanced digital signal processing has driven progress for the last 40 years. The advances in cellular capacity, data rate and quality of service are truly amazing. This has been enabled by advanced digital signal processing techniques being implemented on application specific ICs for reasons of size, weight and power and cost efficiency. However, implementing on ASICs has limited major advances in the standards to about once per decade, as you can see. The transition from generation to generation is enabled by users upgrading their devices on a two or three year life cycle. We would like to upgrade our waveforms and our processing faster than this. This is where the DASH system on a chip comes in. Its programmability enables advanced algorithms to be implemented in low size, weight and power. This helps us in terms of spectrum availability because those advanced algorithms can suppress interference and also enable in-band four duplex or simultaneous transmit and receive on the same frequency, making better use of the spectrum. 
A switching software allows the systems to quickly switch between communications, radar, spectrum monitoring, uh, spectrum monitoring and navigation. Implementing multiple simultaneous, simultaneous modems at the same time enables us to operate new and legacy devices on the same frequency and pour those legacy devices into the new network. Thus, the DASH system on a chip enables high performance communications, navigation and sensing algorithms to be, rapidly, to be rapidly upgraded while maintaining the interoperability that we need. And now, DARPA Microsystems Technology Office Program Manager, Mr. John Davies. Today, AI algorithms can play games at a grandmaster level. A key enabler is a scalable training environment that expose these algorithms to hundreds of years of experiences in the span of days. For RF systems, by which I mean communications, radar, or electronic warfare systems, would significantly benefit from this type of AI-enhanced decision-making. So key reasons for this is that modern RF systems are highly configurable. They must process complex environments and make receive and transmit decisions in microseconds. This combination of complexity and speed presents a significant opportunity for machine-built protocols to substantially outperform their human-designed equivalents. But we lack the infrastructure to rapidly train AIs in high-fidelity RF environments at large scales. This is critical for any learned behavior to be able to translate into the real world. The Digital RF Battle Space Emulator or Derby program will build just such an environment, enabling AI algorithms to train on RF applications 24-7, 365. So how are RF systems developed and tested today? We use a combination of simulation, laboratory, and open air testing. Simulation is much slower than real time or much lower fidelity uh, than, than the real world, possibly both. Uh, lab testing adds real-time, better fidelity, but does not scale to large numbers of RF nodes. Open air is the highest possible fidelity, but very expensive to operate at large scales. Derby creates a new class of laboratory testbed that is simultaneously high fidelity, real-time, and large scale. The approach is to connect large numbers of real RF devices at their RF operating frequencies digitize these signals, then digitally emulate the spectrum interactions among all of these devices. Derby digital processing will add antenna effects, platform motion, propagation channel, as well as reflections from objects in the environment. Uh, operating Derby will be both inexpensive and interactive in order to support high volume AI training pipelines. So RF emulation is not a new idea. But commercial emulators are limited in the scale, meaning the number of ports and the port bandwidth, and fidelity, meaning the number of interactions per link. Recently, to support DARPA's Spectrum Collaboration Challenge, which concluded last fall, DARPA built the world's largest channel emulator, Coliseum. Uh, Coliseum was the largest emulator we could build with commercially available high-performance computing architectures. We need Derby to greatly exceed the emulation capacity of Coliseum. But achieving this vision will require significant advances in real-time HPC architectures. So what are the, are the real-time computing demands of Derby? Well, well, first, we need microsecond sales latency. We need petaflop scale compute, uh, terabits of memory accessed at petabytes per second, plus terabytes per second of system I.O. Uh, how do existing processing technologies map to Derby's needs? Well, general purpose CPU could meet the total memory requirement. Uh, GPUs can meet compute and total memory, uh, but latency is multiple orders of magnitude too slow. FPGAs can meet latency and bandwidth, but can't deliver on total compute or memory. In order to meet all of these demands, Derby needs domain-specific processing optimized for the real-time compute application. Ultimately, Derby will create a capability for laboratory testing at a scale and fidelity that is not possible today. And Derby will be a critical enabler of the development of next-generation AI-enabled RF systems. Thank you.
And now presenting DARPA, Microsystems Technology Office Program Manager, Dr. Ben Griffin. Today I would like to share with you my interest in chip scale filters for X through K bands. RF filters below 8 gigahertz have enabled the coexistence of multiple communication bands within the modern cell phone, with filter counts on the order of 60 to 100. In the recent past, above 8 gigahertz, applications were mainly limited to things like weather, SATCOM, and military applications. However, recently, there's increasing commercialization and as a result, globalization of both the millimeter wave spectrum and technologies. And while commercial systems can act collaboratively using spatial controls through beamforming or taking advantage of atmospheric absorption frequency bands, DoD systems need to be robust to adversarial jamming as well as self-jamming. Chip scale millimeter wave filters for our swap constrained applications are going to be needed for DoD spectral dominance in the future. The goal of a bandpass filter is to pass signals within a particular frequency band and reject all other signals. Ideally, this would look like a rectangular function with zero insertion loss within the bandwidth and infinite rejection in the out of band. In reality, however, the filter is built by a finite set of resonators with their own performance limitations. The key metrics of an RF filter are insertion loss, bandwidth, skirt steepness, and out of band rejection. The size of the resonators that establish the filter is set by the wave speed at the frequency at which they're operating. This graph compares resonator size as a function of frequency. For a given wave speed, the size of the resonator is set by an integer multiple of the half wavelength. Electromagnetic filters are taking advantage of this, the speed of light to establish their individual resonator elements. The performance of electromagnetic-based filters is good, but the size is large, scaling at the electromagnetic wavelength. We can shrink these devices using dielectric materials, but only at the square root of the permittivity. And with the increasing permittivity, we also incur increasing dielectric loss, leading to overall increase in the insertion loss within the device. The miniaturization of electromagnetic filters occurred through the downconversion from the speed of light to the speed of sound via piezoelectric transduction. Bulk acoustic wave-based devices emerge and have demonstrated good performance through 2.5 gigahertz, with new results as high as 6 gigahertz. As we scale these devices to higher frequencies, the size of the resonators is also scaling at 1 over the frequency. And this is leading to unacceptable increases in loss, unacceptable increases in the uncertainty of the center frequency, as well as an increase in the power density dissipated within the resonator. With no other options today, we are forced to go back up to using our electromagnetic-based uh, RF filters in these high frequency bands. However, there are many applications that are swap constrained, such as elemental digital beamforming. These same applications often require multiple channels to be addressed within these same space constraints. New deep sub-wavelength filters are needed uh, to meet this need. And a new technology is needed to fill this space and enable performance that we have come to expect out of our larger electromagnetic-based filters and our smaller but lower frequency acoustic uh, wave-based devices. We expect innovations are needed in emerging materials, new resonator modes, and perhaps even a new fundamental wave to address, overcome the limitations of RF filters at these frequencies. Please be on the lookout for emerging opportunities in this space. Thank you for your attention, and please enjoy the rest of the summit. This concludes our morning plenary. During the break, please visit the networking lounge to meet with fellow attendees, or the exhibit hall to view our latest research posters and demonstrations. The afternoon plenary, Microelectronics Security and Access, will commence at 2.15 p.m. Eastern Time.